Thank you so much for inviting me here today. It's a great honor. I've been asked to talk about creative cities and to share with you some of the work we've been doing in London and also from other cities around the world. So the title of my speech is Chaos and Dreaming. Is this the future of creative cities? More than half the people on planet Earth live in cities and the trend is for city populations to grow and grow. Cities are the energy centers of the world. They shape the future. They are full of spontaneity, of creativity, of risk and vitality. The poet Ben Okri describes them as the magic centers of the world, the world's dreaming places, where the great music of humanity lives, the harmonization of different histories, cultures, geniuses, and dreams. But my question today is, are cities dying? Which might surprise you. As head of culture for the Mayor of London, I've spent the last 12 years working to build London's position as a world-class creative city. My role co covers the breadth of culture, film, design, fashion, visual art, music, dance, and theater. I'm also the chair of the World Cities Culture Forum, the biggest ever gathering of global cities focused on culture. There are 27 cities now, from Paris to Amsterdam, Shanghai to Bogota, New York to Sydney. These are all our members at our annual summit in Istanbul last year. And every member believes that culture is the essential ingredient in cities. In Brazil, World Cities members in Rio have revolutionized film culture by setting up cinemas in the favelas. They have massively boosted access to film for the city's poorer residents. World Cities colleagues in South Africa are looking to culture to heal post-apartheid divisions. This is the Soweto Theatre in Johannesburg. In Colombia, the city of Bogota has, been, has chosen to champion the creativity of its citizens, and the mayor is commissioning graffiti all over the city, which is very progressive given that graffiti is often illegal in cities. In Argentina, the city of Buenos Aires has handed over a crime-ridden suburb to circus. The residents now see the best circus from around the world. Drug dealing has fallen, gangs have disappeared, and a new cafe culture has sprung to life. In Amsterdam, they recently celebrated a year of anniversaries. Major museum relaunches and 400 years of the iconic canal system. They ran a major cultural promotion which helped the residents to rediscover their own city as well as attract visitors. New York defined itself through its cultural quarters from Greenwich Village in the 1950s and 1960s to Williamsburg in the new millennium. A powerful new example is the High Line, a disused railway line that has breathed life into a whole new area of Manhattan. And here in Japan, of course, I know you are all thinking about how creativity can play a major role as part of the Tokyo 2020 Olympic and Paralympic Games. So cities across the globe are increasingly positioning culture and creativity as a central part of their strategies. And in a globalized world, it's our culture that makes us distinctive. We might all drink from the same coffee chain, but it's our culture and creativity that sets us apart. I think the Olympic Games is a good example of this. When a city hosts an Olympic Games, the global spotlight is switched onto that city. Everyone is looking at you, and it's a chance to tell your story to the world. But what does the world see? This slide shows the Olympics in Atlanta and in Beijing and in Athens. What you'll notice from these pictures is that you can't tell the difference. You can't tell which city is which. So making your city stand out in this globalized world, I think, is critical. And my contention is that creativity 
and culture are the way to do this. But what kind of culture are we talking about? Many cities around the world are developing biennales and major museum franchises. And here's another controversial question for today. Are biennales the new Starbucks? We don't want all our cities to look alike. I love this quote. If everyone is thinking alike, then someone isn't thinking. But how does a city define its own story? I believe that authenticity is key. But how do you capture the authenticity of your city, the distinctive and unique story? I believe that artists hold one important key. Because artists, they see the things that we don't see. As the filmmaker Tim Burton, who next month has an exhibition at Mori, once said, it's good as an artist to always remember to see things in a new, weird way. And the former president of the United States, John F. Kennedy, he once said, if art is to nourish the roots of our culture, society must set the artist free to follow his vision, wherever it might take him. This is what we tried to do in London for the 2012 Olympic Games. We invited artists to dream. Hosting an Olympic Games is a once in a lifetime moment for the athletes, for the public, and also for the artists. So we asked artists, what would they like to do for this once in a lifetime moment? And the results were very stunning. We invited the daredevil choreographer Elizabeth Streb from New York to use the whole of London as her canvas. She created extraordinary choreography for London's architecture. This is Elizabeth Streb walking down City Hall, my building. That's my, that's my desk. <laughs> it made the front pages of the newspapers all around the world and helped us to try and tell the story of our city in a fresh way. It brought life to the city and animated it. And animated the landscape that was very familiar in a new way. This is the finale, where the dancers performed in the spokes of London's wheel. We also closed our major city centre, our major landmark, called Piccadilly Circus, and we put a real circus in it. It hadn't been closed since 1940. 1,500 tonnes of feathers were dropped like snow by angels from the sky. 250,000 people came, And it gave the city back to the people. It gave them the chance to play. We asked many artists to dream, and one artist made an exact replica of our important ancient monument, Stonehenge. And he turned it into a bouncy castle. That's me. <laughs> Half a million people have now bounced on this. And it continues now to tour the world as a very unusual Olympic legacy. One morning, the city woke to find our statues had new hats made by our leading hat makers, showcasing both our heritage and our contemporary culture and bringing a smile to people's faces. And the many citizens who didn't get a ticket for the Olympic Games got to be part of the biggest festival ever. This is a massive participation project for the citizens called the Big Dance. So London is a very successful creative city by any standards. It's vibrant and diverse. There are over 300 languages spoken in London every day, making it the most international city in the world. To give you a picture of this, the Tate Modern is the most visited contemporary art gallery on the planet with over 5 million visitors a year. London has over 300 music venues. 32,000 people go to see a theatre show every night. The London Fashion Week is firmly positioned on the fashion calendar alongside Paris, Milan and New York. There are 30 film crews on the streets every day. 
And the creative industries generate 115 billion for the UK economy. The London Design Festival, again, is the biggest in the world. And in fact, there are over 200 festivals in London every year, which for a city with a population of about 8 million shows how central culture and creativity is. But it's easy to forget how important artists and creative people are to this story. Creative people form tribes and subcultures. They give cities oxygen and a genuine personality. And they shape our future and our identity. It's no accident that the punk subculture of the 1970s is the mainstream business of today. This is the renowned world, uh, world-renowned design house, Alexander McQueen. So if change is driven by new ideas and vision, and speaking as a government bureaucrat myself, I believe government needs to put energy and resources into finding those great ideas. The ideas we can never imagine ourselves. We need artists. We need to listen to artists and creative people. But left alone, often cities do the opposite. In London, we're always facing many of these challenges. Many dilapidated parts of the city have been re-energized with artists taking cheap studio spaces. This has led to a growth in business, gentrification, and higher property prices. But this has pushed out the artists who played such an important role in bringing these places back to life. So now we're facing a crisis in London, and artists are unable to afford studio spaces. And because of the pressure on housing and development, London will lose 30% of its artist studios in the next decade. Cities can build big museums, but without artists and creative people, what would we put in them? We don't want a city where there are no artists and no creative people. Creative people give cities authenticity. But unfortunately, cities often extinguish creative talent. I'd like to tell you a story. On the streets of London every year, the mayor hosts a big busking competition for young people to play live music and the best win a prize. This is our mayor launching the competition. But a few weeks ago, a shocking event occurred. The young winners of the mayor's competition were arrested by the police and thrown in jail. The police had arrested them under a very old government act from 1830. And this act prohibits things like kite flying and doorbell ringing, so it's very antiquated. So one of our challenges in London is to remove unhelpful regulations where they have the opposite effect to the ones we really want. This informal culture, a secret cinema in an old warehouse, buskers cheering you on your daily commute, skateboarders weaving in and out of urban architecture, this chaos is a vital ingredient in cities. The chaotic and creative things that happen in the cracks in between the pavements, the things that give the city its spontaneity and buzz, and these are all the reasons people like to live in cities. But can you plan for creativity? As cities, it's in our nature to want to make plans, but it doesn't always work out. I wanted to share another story with you. To celebrate the millennium in 2000, the UK government had the idea to build a spectacular dome to mark this historic moment. They decided it would celebrate everything we'd achieved as a nation and look forward to the future, which sounds like a very sensible idea. However, it didn't work out as was planned. This is the dome. Lots of government agencies got together. Many committees were set up. Lots of money was spent. But arguably, the creative vision was not clear. It didn't have, as Christoph was saying, an artistic vision. The expectation was that many visitors, many more visitors would come. And in fact, it became one of the most controversial public buildings in UK history. The Times newspaper ran the headline, Oops. Attacking the dome is Britain's favorite sport. So often, as Picasso once said, the 
chief enemy of creativity is sometimes good sense. But what if we turn this scenario upside down? If we forgot about good sense and focused on creativity, on dreaming? I love this quote by Albert Einstein. Logic will get you from A to B. Imagination will get you everywhere. Sometimes it pays to suspend logic and allow the imagination to take centre stage. One of our current big projects in London is called the Garden Bridge, dreamt up by the artist and designer Thomas Heatherwick. The Garden Bridge could in fact be a metaphor for city planning. The seed of, an artist by an idea, uh, seed of an idea by an artist nurtured and watered by the city so that it can quite literally grow. It's not a logical solution to get from one side of the river to the other, but a magical garden for the people and not the cars. And this is the Sultan's Elephant, the most ambitious outdoor project we've staged in London, and again, the dream of a French artist, Jean-Luc Cocotte. We closed the whole of central London for a magical story of an elephant and a little girl turning London into a fairy tale for millions of people. This project happened shortly after London was bombed by terrorists. So for many people, it was the first time they had come back onto the streets. So it was a profound gift to the city, and it was part of our healing. So what could we do differently in cities to encourage the best ideas to flourish? And what are the ingredients for success? What do cities need to do if they want to thrive over the next century? If you ask city governments this question, they will usually say they need to boost the economy, increase their international position, improve education and health, solve housing, reduce crime, build communities, and provide a good quality of life. And whatever order this list comes in, quality of life is usually at the bottom. And quality of life is usually the box where culture and creativity sit. So it's very easy to see how culture drops off the list when the pressure is on. My contention is that culture is as important in cities as finance and trade, and it should therefore have equal status. In fact, culture is unique in that it can deliver all manner, a wide range of city priorities. So what's the real story of creativity and culture in cities? I read a study by Michigan State University, and they found that students who had been exposed to the arts were eight times more likely to set up a successful business, leading the tutors to say, we'd better think about how we support artistic activity if we want to rebuild the US economy. So art makes you smart. The arts have helped criminals to change their worldview and rehabilitate. The Advisory Commission on Criminal Justice said, the prison system has achieved a shocking level of failure. The overwhelming evidence is that prisons create crime rather than prevent it. And this is in contrast to a prisoner who'd been involved in an art program. And she said, art allows you to think differently, so you behave differently, so you get different results. To me, that's the definition of rehabilitation. A study found that ballroom dancing cut dementia by 76%. And there's lots more evidence about the powerful impact of culture on health. In London, 80% of visitors say they come to London because of our culture. And we get 34 million visitors a year, so 80% of them coming for culture is a big deal. In the UK, culture generates $17 billion for the UK economy. But fundamentally, culture makes life worth living. Again, as Picasso said, art washes away from the soul the dust of everyday life. But take a moment to imagine a world without culture. Your iPod is blank. There's nothing on at the cinema. The theatres are empty. Or as the artist Grayson Perry so eloquently puts it, Life without art would be a series of emails.
But take a step further and imagine a world without creativity, without the imagination or the invention. Without imagination, there'd be no television, no airplanes, no medicine, no internet. So, if culture solves crime, it makes you smart, it keeps you healthy, it boosts the economy, it heals communities, it gives you a competitive advantage, and it makes life worth living. If you want to be a successful city in the 21st century, you can't do it without creativity. We need creativity to have a better status in cities. But I accept that this is not the comfort zone for government. And as Matisse said, creativity takes courage. It takes, it takes courage for government to let go of some control and not to overplan. We need artists to continue to breathe life into our cities. We don't want sanitized urban landscapes. We need the courage to ask artists to dream. And as we've seen in Paris, in Rio, in Bogota, in New York, and in Johannesburg, and in cities all around the world, culture and creativity can be transformational. Because dreams are powerful things. Dreams are essential in cities as well as in life. So while we need a plan, we also need a dream. I wanted to end by reflecting on Martin Luther King's famous speech. Imagine if he had stood in front of the Lincoln Memorial in 1963, in front of a million people, and instead of saying, I have a dream, he only said, I have a plan. Where would the civil rights movement be today, and would President Obama be in the White House? Thank you.